uh, I grew up in country Victoria. I was a geeky student, I guess. I like I like maths and I like physics and went to university to study electrical engineering. Same as there was no other thing that was remotely as interesting as electrical engineering. So I did that. I got my first job at the university and almost accidentally fell into robotics. We were putting together demonstrations for an open day and I bought this little tiny robot. I think it had five stepper motors in it, so a little tiny arm robot. And I wrote some code in Fortran running on a mini computer that allowed it to play checkers, drafts. And uh, it was, that was good. It was, uh, it, it was very popular at the, uh, at the open day, uh, which I'm happy about. And then maybe a year later, there was an advertisement in the newspaper, CSRO were looking for roboticists. I thought, that's pretty cool. So I applied, got the job, and I worked for CSRO for 25 years uh, in Melbourne initially, doing a lot of work uh, for the manufacturing industry, which is a, you know, kind of the traditional user of robotics. And then we got into other weird things like uh, traffic, uh, traffic monitoring systems and sewer inspection systems. We made food sorting machines. And then I moved to Brisbane to try and take some of the robotic technology that we developed for manufacturing and apply it to mining. And it was pretty naive when I did this because I thought, well, okay, a mine is like a factory, you know, you're sort of moving stuff around. Yeah, the machines are a bit bigger. Now, how hard can it be? Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so we uh, built a, a really great team of people at CSR up here in Brisbane, and we did a lot of work in the mining industry. So we automated big open pit excavation machines, things called drag lines, which can you know, move 100 tons of dirt at a time. And we did some work with underground mining, so machines called load haul dump units, which are like a little squat front end loader machines that run around underground and carry and carry ore. And so we automated those, basically self driving, self driving cars, self driving vehicles in the late 90s. You know, underground, 20 kilometres an hour, with you know this much clearance between you know, the vehicle and the walls, of the tunnel. And that technology got commercialised, which is wow. pretty nice as a scientist slash engineer. Uh, it's nice when your stuff gets gets into a product. I think that, to me personally, anyway, that's as, that's as good as it gets. And then we looked at other applications. We started doing flying robots in again in the very late '90s. This is before drones were a thing. So we uh, automated small petrol-powered helicopters. Worked on some very early four-rotor flying robots, early 2000s. And yeah, you know, I'm amazed at how far drones have come. Uh, you know, you can just buy them from the shop and they just work. Uh, and the things that we built back then were heavy, daggy, and didn't work all that well. Uh, brilliant technology. Then 2010, I uh, got interested in uh, basically change of, change, of, change of direction, came to university, uh, became a professor of robotics, which is a pretty cool title, and been involved in education and setting up a really major research group here at QUT particular focus being on robotic vision. So how do you give robots the the ability to see like like we have? In particular how to do hand-eye coordination, which is something we really underestimate. You know, we want to pick something up on my desk and I just look down and just pick it up. And I don't know the coordinates of the glasses, I don't know the coordinates in my hand. I pick them up by effectively minimizing the error between where my hand is and where the glasses are. So I do it in a very different way to which robots do it. And I'm really interested in is can robots do it in a way that's more human-like, which would make it faster, more graceful, and more reliable. All the things that robots are not. I think the most exciting thing about robotics today is the awesome computing power that we've got available to us. So when I started doing robotics a long time ago, 80s, uh, computers were pretty poor. I mean, the first vision system I built, and I'm, was really always interested in very high-speed computer vision. So I had a, a rack, a 19-inch rack of equipment, all these VME bus cards in there doing the image processing. You know, today, you know, just you know, my, my uh, laptop computer can do better and better and faster. Huge amount of computation available to us, and that's really important. Because I think on the perceptual side of robotics, to me, that's where the biggest challenges are. So we can build pretty good robot machines, have been able to for decades. Uh, so whether it's a robot arm, whether it's a car, whether it's a flying drony thing, right? Uh, the machine's not the problem. It's the smarts, it's the intelligence that's the problem. 
and my focus has been on perception. So looking at this table, how do I recognize where there's a pair of glasses and how should I pick them up? That's really hard. And we struggle with that for a very, very long time. People have been doing computer vision research since the, since the 60s. And in the last five years, there's been this amazing breakthrough in deep learning. Deep learning has revolutionized computer vision. So we can train a deep net with lots of images and I could take a picture of this table and say, where are the, where are the glasses? And it would say, there's the glasses, draw a, square, uh, draw a box around them. And that, that's pretty nice. Uh, you say, where's the book? And then draw a box around that and say, there's, there's a book. So that's pretty good. Um, we've got the computing power to be able to run these networks in real time. Training is not real time. Training still take days to weeks on uh, racks full of GPUs, but we have that kind of computing power available to us. People like Google have it, have heaps of it. But at the university, we've got pretty decent uh, GPU-based computing power. So yeah, we lots of the students here are all working on projects that involve deep learning. So the, the long answer, uh, I think the prodigious amount of computing that's available to us today, the amount of data that we've got for training, and then this new technique, deep learning, which requires you to have lots of computing and lots of data. We have those two prerequisites, so yeah, deep learning rules. To be, to be flippant, I think the biggest misconception about robots is that they work. Uh, and we have lots of robots in the lab and students spend a lot of time here uh, struggling to get robot systems to work. Uh, you have a demo and I think we're all sort of secretly crossing our fingers and hoping that the robot will work for this demo. Reliability is not nearly as good uh, as, as it should be. So I think uh, we probably lack some sort of craft or discipline in, in creating robots. There's also open source code out there which, which helps, but most robots are still bespoke creations, uh, you know, built by an individual for a particular task. And they're brittle, and they don't generalize well to a different task. So we're good at building robots that can do just one thing, like maybe it finds crown thorn starfish and eradicates them or finds weeds in a field, it can do that. But, it can't, but they can't cross over easily, yeah. even though the technologies involved are similar. So, yeah, a, a robot like you see uh, in the movies, so a C-3PO and R2-D2, uh, Rosie, uh, the, the robot made from the Jetsons, robots that can do many things competently and interact well with human beings, still, still cutting edge. Uh, we're, not, we're quite a way away from that. The thing that has surprised me the most is the rise of self-driving cars. Uh, self-driving cars is really a robotic technology. They're mobile robots. Uh, they carry people around. And the technology has been developing slowly over, over a long period of time. I think well, all of us in the robotics community knew that this would become possible. What we didn't understand was the huge public appetite for this technology, or the apparent public ap appetite for this technology. And you, while we researchers were probably worrying about things like, uh, you know, what are the legalities of it and what happens if something goes wrong, who's to blame, actually that doesn't actually, that doesn't seem to be a, a showstopper. And people are cracking on at a huge pace and I'm sure the laws and the way we do insurance and all of that stuff will be dealt with because the public really want self-driving cars. People are over traffic. People are over driving. Driving is not a delight anymore. People just want to get from point A to point B. And that's what robots do. Robots move themselves or things from point A to point B. Okay. So yeah, that was the, that's a really big surprise. The other one I'd say would be humanoid robots, which I have for a very long time thought to be rather gimmicky and I couldn't really see the point of it. It probably says more about me than it does about humanoid robots. Uh, but I, watching the way general public interact with a humanoid robot is, is fascinating. Uh, people are deeply involved with them, deeply engaged. And, and I think as roboticists we can, I'll say, exploit, harness uh, that ability of human beings to connect with something else that looks like a human. Uh, and if you've got emotional cues, the robot uses uh, the facial, facial gestures, emotional gestures, the level of communications it can have with a person is just, is just so much deeper. So it's a little bit spooky. Uh, we've actually recently started a project in, in humanoid robots, not so much on the human 
robot interaction side, which is very important. We don't have too much skill in that area. We're really interested in just giving those robots traditional robotic capability, like being able to navigate around this floor here. So my dream is within a year, uh, when you come to my lab, you'd be greeted by a humanoid robot. And you say, where's Peter? And it will know where I am and it'll take, you can say, follow me, and it will take you there. And it'll give lab tours and all sorts of things like that. And I think that's, that's not so far away. There seems to be a lot of activities for young people today that involve robotics, even from primary school level up. So you know, young, young people are encouraged to build robots to do, sometimes act quite complex tasks. If you look at some of the, the challenges within, say, First Robotics League, you know, the students are building you know, seriously sophisticated robots. But I think there comes a point where you have to transition from tinkering, fiddling, creating a robot by experimentation, trial and error, you have to start engineering. And engineering is a discipline. You know a lot about, about mathematics and about physics, and it reduces the time to come up with a solution because you use design principles um, and knowledge that humanity has collected over, over centuries. You can apply that to create a robot in a whole lot less time. So at some point, probably late high school, uh, you're going to make a transition from uh, fiddling experimentation to using principles, mathematical principles, principles of physics to understand how robots uh, work, how they operate and how to be able to design them. Okay. So uh, advice to, to young people, study maths, uh, you know, applied maths, pure maths, uh, physics and know how to code. You know, don't, be, don't, be scared of, don't be scared of coding. And you probably want to be learning programming languages like uh, C, C++, Python, uh, the, the languages that are very, very commonly used in, in building robots. I've been interested for a very long time in education and helping people get up to speed with robotics. It is a big field. There's a lot of theory that you need to understand, I think, before you can start to be, uh, be engineering robot systems. So more than 20 years ago, I started off with creating some open source code. Originally it was for my own benefit and I shared it and lots of people piled in and liked it and used it. So I've been maintaining it for a long period of time. But what I found with creating open source code is mostly people just complain. It doesn't do this, doesn't do that. They haven't read the instructions and they say it's broken. So it's a bit frustrating uh, doing that. And I know that this code is used by other people for teaching, but the students are not hearing my voice. They're hearing the teacher's voice and they're using or misusing my code to educate students. So when I came, came to university, I thought, okay, I need to put this right. The students need to be hearing my voice. So I wrote a book. This is the book, beast of a book. Uh, and it says everything that I think is important that students should learn about, about robotics. And it's written for undergraduate engineer level. So it's not you don't have to have a PhD to understand this book if you're second, third year engineering student, computer science student, you should be able to understand this book. Tons of code examples. And so this is good. Now it's my voice. But it isn't exactly because other people use my book and then they teach a class and they pick and choose bits of bits of what it is and and it's still they're interpreting what's in my book and presenting it to a class. So I thought, okay, I'm going to nail this, right? They've got to hear my voice and see my face uh, as I teach them about robotics. So the Robot Academy was born out of that. So a big project a few years ago at QT where we created lots of video lessons, over 200 video lessons about robotics, particularly robot arms. Uh, nothing at the moment about mobile robots. A lot about simple computer vision and how you tie them together to create what I call robotic vision. And so they ran as uh, online courses uh, starting in 2015 and then we've reconfigured them re recently so they still run as online courses. But an online course is nice, start at the beginning, take you through step by step to an end point. But if you just want to know a thing, just one thing, and you have to wait until the course comes around, it starts, starts three, th three times a year, so you have to wait till it comes around, scroll through the stuff, so that's what I wanted to learn. It's not random access, right? It's not like a wiki. So I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is take that same content and create another view of it. And that's what the Robot Academy is. The Robot Academy is a gorgeous WordPress front end. 
uh, that lets you search for the topics, but they're also organized in groups in different ways, and it takes you right to the lesson. So if you want to know what on earth is a, is a Jacobian, right? You can just type Jacobian in the search box, up will come a few lessons that are related to Jacobians, and away you go. You don't have to wait for the course to come around. So we think people who want a refresher, people who've just heard a term and want to know what it means, you can just dive right in there and get it. And if you don't understand the fundamental principles behind the Jacobian, well then you can go to an earlier lesson and pick that up and then come back to the Jacobian. We say, okay, now I know what Jacobian, how, how do I use it? Well then, you know, you can go to successor lessons. So uh, that's what the Academy is. It's all this content uh, that I've been working on for lots of years told in the way I think it should be told and in a way I think that that's quite quite engaging and captivating and it's at quite different levels actually when I looked at the material some of it you can actually access if you were just a member of the general public and had no maths so we got content on what are robots and why do we need them and ethics anyone can understand that but some of the lessons require that you know some you know about imaginary numbers and some calculus so so they're rated, rated from one to five. And so you, based on what you know, you can say, well, this lesson's for me, or this lesson is not for me. All the lessons on the Robot Academy are available for free to everybody, wherever you are in the world. And the URL is robotacademy.net.au.